And thank you for joining us for our webinar with regard to our upcoming, our new documentary on African Censored Fall of the Pride, which charts the journey of Kenya Airways, Kenya's national carrier, uh, our pride in the skies for a number of years from its place of pride and profit to near penury and you know near collapse to the point that we are at now uh, with Kenya reconsidering nationalizing the national carrier in order to save it and perhaps give it some longevity in years to come. The documentary will walk you through the, the, the various stages of Kenya Airways growth, but I don't want to, um, to, to preempt anything by, by talking you through that. But two people from this very documentary that we've produced um, are here with us to join us and d discuss really what the journey of Kenya Airways has been for the past uh, number of years that it's experienced profit as well as loss. Um, and joining me, of course, is uh, George Bordo. He's an investment analyst. George, thank you very much for joining us this evening. And um, a colleague, a former colleague of mine and investigative reporter, right now I've seen him uh, doing a couple of hard hitting stories about the managed equipment leasing scheme, uh, just off of the back of uh, doing quite some stunning work on uh, the COVID-19 millionaires, Mr. Paul Wafula, investigative journalist for the Daily Nation. Thank you very much for joining me, gentlemen. Now, uh, George, you've looked at the numbers. Um, for Kenya Airways for a number of years. I mean, Paul, you've done so as well, but perhaps George, from an investor's point of view, this is this this this, this expression is used very often, perhaps not even in the right term in our country. But when really did the rain start beating Kenya Airways? And you can unmute your mic uh, so that we can start. Don't worry, these are the vagaries of doing things remotely. <laughs> I think yeah. a couple of things. First is that um, I have been an investment analyst for 10 years and I started covering Kenya Airways uh, in 2012 uh, when they, at the point when they were uh, selling shares uh, to raise uh, money for what, they, what is in aviation is called the PDP, the pre-delivery payments. Essentially, um, uh, it's, it's some kind of deposit. You make deposit payments in it before you, deliver, uh, so you, before you, you receive aircraft. Um, and, and at that point, I think that was like 2011 thereabouts. And then they came and did the rights issue around uh, uh, the first quarter of uh, the launch rights in the first quarter of 2012. That is my first brush with Kenya Airways. Um, I think at that point, when the, uh, the airline was doing a rights issue, the share price had lost almost 80% back then. Um, uh, that's a big picture. And at that point, the, the project, which was called the Project Mawingu, right? They had a very beautiful name, Project Mawingu, uh, was supposed to revitalize the airline um, and give it a new life. Uh, I think back then, uh, management led by Titan Iskun, they, Naikuni, they, they sat back, they sat down as a, as a team, and they decided that Kenya Airways needed to grow big for them to, um, to, to save the opportunity in the aviation space. And I think when we were being introduced to the team Project Mawingu, um, as an investment analyst back there, I think I saw some upside for a stock that had lost 80% back then. This is going to give it some upside, you know. Um, but then there were issues. Issues came after Project Mango. First of all, um, um, the project was very ambitious, by the way. They wanted to um, increase um, the wide body aircraft that they had. They didn't have a lot of them back then. And at that point, they had made some orders for the 787. At that point, the project, 78 project, 78 project was just a few years into life, and Kenya Airways had orders. I think that about, um, they, had, they were expecting to deliver about eight back then, or 787-800. Um, they had also expanded the routes. Um, they were growing so much. They, they were, they had a lot of, they, they had incorporated a, a lot of uh, European routes. Um, and, and at that point, there was also China, a lot of, uh, they had also launched China. And so they needed, they figured they needed more white body aircraft to be able to service the routes. They need to avail more capacity, more aviation assets from this. Um, but the project had challenges. One is that um, well, JKA expansion was a big problem. I remember I couldn't complain, I couldn't complain about JKA expansion. Remember we had the Greenfield project, which for a number of times went to take off. Um, so there was capacity uh, infrastructure constraint at JKI. Um, there was also the financing. By the way, 
This project had a total financing requirement of about $3.6 billion. At that point, that's a lot of money. That's, and, and that's a lot of money. That's, uh, that's uh, what, 400, uh, what, 400 it's million about 400 more than billion. The, the cost of the SGR. Yeah, it's just about, yeah, actually, that's the cost of the SGR. And they needed to raise this financing from, um, and largely from credit, um, uh, and most of them export credit. Um, and that, I figured out the balance sheet of Kenya at that point was two weeks to accommodate $3.6 billion debt at that point, um, given the fact that they were already quite leveraged at that point. And the, the final the thing is, is um, so not the final, the third thing is that uh, aviation business is very tricky. Um, live alone any and, and, and management. Aviation business is very tricky. Um, airlines have to grapple with a lot of assets, which is a lot of variables that are beyond, beyond their control. Uh, when you talk about things like global cost of money, the, the global interest rates, um, the interest rates on euro and, and dollar, they have no control over this. Yeah, the political risk factors, sometimes some of your key markets could be experiencing political, um, and we've seen it. We've seen Egypt, sometimes they can't fly into Egypt because of political, domestic political issues. We've seen yeah. South Sudan, we've seen a number of African countries that they can't fly into it because of uh, insecurities, political instabilities, and these are things that they can't control. So sometimes some of their yeah. first of all routes that they have to pose them for some time. Um, the, the other issue is the global, the, the cost of, uh, of fuel, and they really have no control of the cost of fuel. Sometimes, in fact, I remember between um, 2008 yeah. and 2013, the global cost of fuel really shot up, and these are things that we can't mm. control, and, and Kenya Airways got into arrangement um, uh, I think the fuel hedging is a really important. Yeah, fuel hedging is a really important part yeah. of Kenya Airways' story. But before we get to that, I just want to bring Paul in. Paul, same question: Where did the rain start beating Kenya Airways? And perhaps an, an addendum to your question, because you're a journalist, you can you 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 are used to being asked many questions. Um, as journalists, as reporters, and as a media fraternity, did we truly understand what Project Mawingu was about to the extent that we could explain it? and show the risks as well as the opportunities of what a number of people, including George, have said was a very ambitious project, but, you know, uh, was plagued by various vagaries, if you will. Uh, John, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think uh, I, would, I would pick up from where George left, and I agree with you. Uh, project Mawingu was, um, was reported from a cheering squad uh, perspective. I mean, everybody was happy with it. It looked like this is the right thing to do. And, and journalists went into it and, 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 and so to speak, just bought the dream. And anytime there's a little bit of, of questions, and, and remember that time, Daitas Naikuni is not the easiest of people to ask tough questions, because if you went out of script, uh, you would uh, most easily be thrown out of his press conference, but it happened even to me a few times. Uh, so you will stick to the narrow of, of what he wants you to ask, and if you go out of that script, it becomes problematic. And even I'm sure even the closed uh, door meetings that they had even with some analysts, he was not able to, to give so much more than what he wanted to give. But uh, so to speak, uh, from a growth perspective, um, I think it was a very, very uh, a good project, uh, um, a plan, so to speak. Uh, they were looking at, um, at, at, at Africa as if they're the only airline that is operating or that is seeing the opportunities. So for me, that's where the rents are beating them because they were looking at Africa and not thinking that Ethiopia airline will be seeing the same opportunities. Uh, Rwanda Air is, is uh, neighboring here will also be seeing the same opportunities. And so they, they went flat out just to think about uh, Africa as their own uh, playground. And that's where they missed it. And so for me, um, when uh, um, when uh, when Al Shabaab hit Nairobi, um, that was just the the, the, the the worst time for Kenya because they were unable to actually move fast enough to appreciate the risk that this was coming. So they first yeah. were hit by Al Shabaab, and then before they would come out of it, they, they, they went into a procurement sort of um, most of the deals were procurement driven. Uh, so the aircraft, we're not so sure if they're really uh, bought or leased because they really wanted them or because they wanted to satisfy some quotas who were interested in the business of aircraft. If you look at even something like food, uh, it's, it's a very locked area for Kenya Airways. So look at fuel, there's a specific uh, 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 you know, person who, who must eat from the fuel. The same thing even at the airport. Uh, so, so you have procurement that is actually benefiting people 
rather than the airline. You can even drill, drill this down to even hotel bookings. Look at ticketing. There's, there have been so many ticketing scandals. The letters just claimed a few people about uh, two, two months ago. So people are booking tickets and still stealing from the airline. So from everywhere else, um, you find everybody wants to get something from uh, KQ and give back very little. And you see, at this time, you have a very strong uh, union. You have pilots who are stuck to their guns and they don't want to move. I mean, pilot unions are very strong elsewhere in the world, but they sometimes when there's reason within the calls. So you find a very, very uh, aggressive union that refuses just to talk and to dialogue. So if you are the captain or the pilot of this, uh, of this plane, uh, at, the, at some point the cabin crew are shouting at you, you know, uh, the, leak, the, the fuel is leaking, uh, you find the runway is not tarmacked where you're going to land, and nobody's helping you. So you find a helpless CEO who is trying to steady the ship, but he's being thrown at everything from every other direction. And so it becomes very difficult to be able to, to stabilize and, KQ. Yeah. And, and, Paul, and Paul, part of the public narrative um, that began to build, especially when the losses started to mount um, in Naikuni's era, as well as Mbuvi Gunza going on to Sebastian Mikosh and, and so on and so, so forth, um, hopefully Alan Kilavuka won't have you know, this uh, burden to, uh, to bear for much longer. Um, while all of this was going on, and, and you've characterized this almost as an elephantine problem with, with various issues attacking, you know, attacking Kenya, procurement issues and the pilferage and the corruption. If you were to put this on a sliding scale, right, um, how much of the problems that you have described, how much of the problems that Kenya Airways is facing can be directly attributed to procurement, to mismanagement, to pilferage, to corruption? Um, as, you know, as outsiders, we often tend to point at the leadership and connote that corruption might have taken place. Is that really the story that you've seen? I think I'll, I'll, I'll see that um, to some extent. But I think, I think um, for me, uh, you know, if you're playing for a team, Alan, um, uh, uh, all, all the players may not be strong, but you know where the goal is. And everybody tries as much as possible to to get as close as possible to that, so that they increase their chances of scoring. So if everyone, even if it's the weakest player, is trying to do that, then, then you have a better chance of succeeding. But here you find um, a small team. Look at the management of KQ. It, it's always been out of touch with, with, with the ground. Whichever management you come with, uh, from Naikunis, Gunzes, and even from because he has very funny nicknames before he left. Um, everybody was in their cocoon, living you know, in some small dream with small managers and promoting people because they're friends, because they're listening to them, or they appear to be supporting their, their decisions, rather than the competent ones. If you are the competent person at KQ, you are likely to be shown the door. If you're the kind of guy who's the devil's advocate and asking, are we, do we really need this at this time? You are likely the person to go. So all this, you know, at some point for me, I, I think it's like a leaking, you know, a leaking bucket from every other angle. So we, you, at the end of the day, what is going to happen is that the water is going to run out. And that's what's happened. So some, some of the holes were bigger than the others, but at the end of the day, every hole was leaking. So from management perspective, we had challenges. Uh, of, of management and then they, they you know every time they find something they're good at, at blaming something so if, if you're not blaming al-shabaab uh, you will be blaming uh, fuel hedging and so you'll be asked why then hedge at this level why don't you learn from these lessons of hedging next year after uh, the year after next year again they'll be coming back to the hedging as what has hit them uh, so hard so either just having competent people there or they're just finding experts good through how good at finding experts because KQ is not the only airline operating within the same environment like we are operating them. Yeah. And so that's why I'm, I'm convinced that nationalization is just escaping. You know, it's, it's like, you know, taking in a, 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 an indisciplined child instead of allowing that kid to be disciplined. You're taking, you take them in and put them in a cover in a room and, 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 and keep keeping them for hoping that they will recover. Yeah, so for me, I think uh, these guys need tough love. They need to operate like a company. They need to compete. And they need to do the right thing. And, and that's the only way we shall uh, put uh, back the pride of Africa in the skies. Right. George, George, I want to bring you in, and, and you can unmute now because I'm about to, uh, I'm about to bring you into this conversation. Uh, George, you can unmute. Um, uh, look, there's a very interesting analogy that Paul has used, a leaking bucket, right? Do you, first, do you agree that it, it really is a leaking bucket? 
And now since, um, you know, Paul's, Paul's mentioned nationalization and that's the move that we're going to, well, if uh, the LSK's prayers are defeated in court, that's possibly the move that we're going to. Um, do you think that this is the right path that we should be taking? No, it's not the right path. But before I get to that, um, I need to say that the airline business is a, it's a thin margin business, very, very thin margin. Airlines globally are not, able, I'm not even able to return capital as a shareholder. Um, to the extent that it's so thin that any strong wind blows the, the blown away. So it requires a lot of discipline um, and a lot of carefulness and a lot of um, meticulous in, in how you run airline business. And if this do we was, have that in do we have that in Kenya Airways management? Have no, we they had don't that? Have that. And you have to be very smart how you run an airline business. Be, right from um, uh, commercialization to how you procure your materials, it has to be at the least cost. Now, unfortunately, with Kenya Airways, and especially I think Project Maringu invited a lot of free footage in the company. Um, mm -hmm. because I think all of a sudden people saw um, this this fat wallet to be um, to be uh, you know to dip your, your hand into. And, and that's that's when you ask where the rain started to beat it. I think for me, if you ask me, it's when the project Marine when the project Marine was unveiled. That's when the rain started to beat the Um it's, it's, it's when you have a thin margin business like that, you have to be very deliberate in how, what you do when you have to do. Everything has to be least cost. I, I tell you what, probably in the early 2000s, going backwards, Kenya Airways could easily step back and fill up planes, right? Um, now, as Drake Air welcomed more airlines, that that phenomenon went away, and the airline needed to innovate, be more aggressive. As early as late as uh, sorry, as late as 2015, and I remember when I was doing some analysis, um, all the travel agents in Nairobi, the share of Kenya Airways had shrunk 30 percent, which means travel agents are not longer selling Kenya Airways anymore, and that played into the commercialization. They had to. They had it to be very smart. Airline well, business well, I mean, is more agile. Yeah. All right. So I was I was asking uh, George, was really the, the the issue of other airlines coming in here to compete on Kenyan soil a decision that was Kenya Airways to make, or did that even come from the cabinet level? Because you know, let's be fair, there are some decisions that are made that are beyond. Uh, Kenya Airways control and they have to compete sometimes with their hands tied behind their backs. At least that's what current and former management has said. Yeah, uh, Kenya Airways for me is a private business. Public traded company until before it, uh, uh, until it was the other day, it's a private business. They have shareholders to worry about. It's not the same case with Ethiopian Airlines. It's not the same case with South African Airlines. Um, these guys don't have shareholders to worry about. So then the decisions that Kenya Airways makes has to be very optimal. The shareholder has to be um, at, the, at the forefront. They can't, um, they, they can't for instance, um, make the same um, pro procurement decisions uh, like Ken Ethiopian Airlines will do because they have to worry about giving the shareholders dividends. Um, Ethiopian Airlines doesn't have to worry about that. Ethiopian Airlines enjoys a lot of tax incentives, by the way. Um, they don't pay dividends. Uh, I think they don't pay income tax. Um, the the, the Ethiopian airline uh, commercial business is, is air space is literally closed. If you go to Bali today, by the way, if you land at Bali in morning between seven and and and, and nine a.m., all you'll see is Ethiopian uh, airline uh, aircraft. You rarely see in between. You'll see probably one another aircraft tucked in between probably Kenya Airways. But you see the, if you go to JK at nine p.m., you'll see all these international airlines, right? Mm -hmm. Um, uh, you'll see Emirates, you see EA, you see all the South Korean Chinese airlines, there's so many airlines. It shows you that, that it's a very competitive uh, airport and, and all these global airlines fly in there. So it requires Kenya Airways to be more agile and then they have to be more deliberate um, in some of the decisions they take. Um, like for instance, I gave an example the other day when I came to your office. One is, uh, if you're a frequent flyer to your back today, Right, and, and, and that means you fly more often to Johannesburg. That means, and if you do most of those flights on Kenya Airways, that means Kenya Airways has to recognize you first of all. And, and, and they have to ask you, by the way, your, your travel to Johannesburg doesn't just end with the flight on Kenya Airways. There are so many things you're going to do there. You're going to leave the airport, your hotel, and you're going to 
probably example out uh, a, a few restaurants in Johannesburg where they're staying there. Now, Kenya Airways need to find out what you're going to do in Johannesburg, where you're going to stay. Can we drive you to the hotel? Can we book for you the hotel where you're going to stay? Now, their, their journey with Kenya Airways ended with the flight. Once you went in the, in the, in the airport, in South Africa, they don't care what they're going to do there. Now, that called for a more agile management, which I didn't see. The manager needed to be very swift, um, very deliberate, and very forecasting. And I didn't see that. So I like to explain, I think, sometimes right. they blame management. Okay, let, let me bring you again. Uh, uh, let me bring you in, uh, Paul, and talk about something that's been a huge, huge burden on the back of uh, Kenya Airways. And we see it reflecting in the balance sheets even today, which is fuel hedging. Um, Paul, because you write for the public, can you explain to the public what exactly is fuel hedging and where did Kenya Airways get it wrong? Uh, Alan, um, I, will, I, will, I will explain fuel hedging simply as this. Um, that you want to buy uh, a commodity, let's say, a um, commodity that changes its prices uh, quite often. Let me pick something like bread. Uh, you want to, to buy bread uh, the whole year. Uh, for your house, and you, you want to budget at um, uh, at fifty shillings, yeah, and, and you are happy that fifty shillings is um, it, it's good for you to buy the bread. So you go to a bread manufacturer and tell them, um, I'm going to be buying bread from you for the next uh, one year, and, and I'll be happy to pay fifty shillings. And they say, okay, fine, um, that's it. So you pay fifty shillings. So you negotiate that price up front. And then, uh, but in between the year, uh, there is something that disrupts one of this, uh, one, one of the, co I mean, uh, ingredients that make uh, bread. So maybe wheat is a shortage because we're importing and something like that. So the bread, uh, the bread, the prices shoot up, maybe uh, they go to 55 or 60. So if you have negotiated uh, with, uh, with, with your bakery that you'll be buying it at 50, you are in the money because at the end of the day, you'll be saving five shillings while everybody else in the market will be buying at 55. So you are good to go. Uh, on the flip side is that um, uh, you've hedged at 50 shillings for the whole year, and then um, there's an, an oversupply of wheat uh, in the market. And, and, and prices uh, for bread drop to 30 shillings to 40 shillings. Now you are stuck with buying a bread at 50 shillings when everybody else is buying it at 30 shillings. And that's how we now end up making losses. So you find uh, uh, the, the, the discussion about the price for Kenya Airways was always um, out of money, as in they were losing money from the hedges so that at the end of the day, they were paying more and not benefiting from the hedges. So that's how they were taking a hit year, on, uh, year after year. Uh, so, so you will ask yourself, what really went wrong with these hedges? That they were not able to um, um, uh, consistently, or at least to a larger degree, end up making some savings from the hedges. Uh, so they, they were better off buying um, buying in the, uh, uh, with other associations. We have associations in Africa uh, of carriers that actually buy as a block and they end up getting a better price. KQ will not consider that, but they will insist on this hedging even when it's not working. Why? Because there's somebody down the line who is going to make money either way uh, at, whatever, at whatever cost. So, so for okay. me, I think that is really how I explain hedging. I hope that is clearer. All right, George, I'm seeing you nodding in agreement. Sorry, George, you have to unmute. Um, I'm seeing you nod, nodding in agreement. Um, fuel hedging, do you think that the, the, the strategy that uh, Kenya Airways took rather than going with uh, perhaps a number of other people and, and buying together so that they have better bargaining power, do you think that um, fuel hedging was a way to go? Because to be fair also, there had been some benefits earlier on um, to fuel hedging. There were some savings that were made, I think, I believe in... Uh, the 2011-2012 financial year, or, or I think the year after that, um, I'd, need, I'd need to be corrected on that. But there have been a number of years where Kenya Airways has, you know, benefited from the, the impact of fuel hedging. But, you know, over to you, George, what, what are your thoughts? Um, just to add a bit more flavor to Paul's explanation, in simple terms for me, fuel hedging is just a bet. Um, <clears throat> if you taking a, the airline is taking a bet that fuel, uh, certain risks are going to occur, and fuel prices will rise. So in common balance, Betty Lichomeka. It's Betty Lichomeka. So, um, and, and the person selling you the bets is also betting that those risks are not going to occur. So whoever loses the bet pays the other. And unfortunately, Kenya has lost the bet. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you look at the balance sheet today, you'll find, uh, I think, the last year, they were sitting on a loss of about 12 million shillings. Um, that is related to, they're calling it cash flow hedging losses. 
accumulative loss is about 12 billion to me, which is a big hole. I don't know how they, they will get out of that hole. But they were not very smart on these on these hedges. For me, I, I, at least you, you see some upside in 2012. I think I've always been against the hedges ever since we first announced them uh, way back. I think it was in 2011. Because I think they were being shafted most of the time. Um, first of all, hedges have become more, it's not, it's not unusual thing for airlines to do, a lot of, globally airlines do hedge uh, a lot of things by the way, that they don't control. Um, they hedge fuel prices, they hedge interest rates for some of the dollar borrowing, um, and, and they even hedge uh, currencies because um, a lot of them have foreign currency borrowing, but some places they receive money, they earn in local currency, so they have to do the hedges to, to protect them. But hedges have become more flexible. Um, uh, today, you can even hedge per route. You can even decide, okay, Lagos, uh, Nairobi, Lagos, I'm going to hedge fuel, and I'm going to hedge um, uh, X amount of quantity of fuel for that specific route. Um, if you feel like you're losing money on overall hedges, then you can decide to hedge. Uh, because honestly, there's some routes that you incur significant margin that you don't even, even if you don't hedge, you're still in the money. Like for instance, Kenya Airways trips to West Africa, like Adelaide, like Liberia, Sierra Leone, the tickets are very expensive because they're probably one of the few airlines that fly there and they can charge you what they want. So on those routes, you can decide to say, I'm not gonna hedge. You can decide to hedge your, your uh, China Guangzhou route because the margins are very thin and you don't want, you want to have a visibility of the cash flows. Um, they didn't do all this. Uh, first of all, the amount, the, the quantity to fill the hedging, sometimes I think were very big um, and the length of the hedges, was so thick. Sometimes they would hit six, nine months. So mm. thick that if prices uh, go um, 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 beyond the strike, beyond the strike price, you are unable to exit and, 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 and receive the money out of that. So the quantity right, and the timing sometimes were for me were, were very unusual. All right, gentlemen, I, I want to let you go now, and um, I have a last question for you. We, we've touched uh, we've touched on it um, in the course of the conversation and that's nationalization. Um, George, I'll start with you in a minute. Your thoughts about nationalization, is it the devil or the deep blue sea? Ah, nationalization for me, I mean, it's, it's, it's not a good idea. It's a bad idea. And for me, it's a very simple reason. One is that there is no evidence that if you national Kenya Airways, that its business fundamentals will improve. As a matter of fact, if you national Kenya Airways to be you're, it's basically going to join the, the typical government bureaucracy, um, and that's that's not good for business. Government has not been the best business in this part of the world, and we we know that we've seen that before. All right, Paul. How about you? Same question. Uh, because the, John, the reason why they're saying they're nationalizing it is to give it um, a, a, a sort of um, uh, to put it in a place where they can actually be able to improve their uh, balance sheet. Uh, and so uh, basically breathe some air into it and stop it from uh, imminent uh, cash, cash flow crisis that they are in right now. Uh, if, if the government is a, the largest shareholder, give them cash. If, if you really want to support them, give them, give them a, a loan. Tell them you guys have to operate at these levels. You have your staff costs have to be at these levels. Your margins should be at these levels. Once you hit them, we give you this cash. So if you, you give them at, at, at a carrot and stick until they get out of it and you win them off and they go back into the market. That's a healthy uh, relationship where you're not just throwing money. Now, on the other side is um, they're, they're coming into government, as, as, as Bodo said, uh, they're coming into the civil service mentality. They can't compete um, from a private sector perspective because you have nothing to lose. Your salary is going to come from the taxpayer. So you, your services are going to be worse off than there. Uh, nobody's going really to think about KQ as, as, as a business, uh, uh, you know. So, so it's going to suffer more in terms of from a competition side. I don't see it competing uh, better uh, from a nationalized perspective than if it was just a free airline whose decisions are being done in a boardroom uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in Embakasi and it's purely uh, uh, for the good of the business operation. Right now, it's going to be a totally different ball game. And uh, as Bodo said, government has never been good in business. I don't see them being uh, better because of KQ. And just a, a, another another disaster waiting to happen. Uh, but something else I just wanted to mention, Alan, yeah. is that um, KQ um, is not just, a, 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 let's say, a, a company 
we, we don't look at KQ in terms of just what it brings to the economy as just the you know the, the, the amount of money that it's doing at ticket sales. But as a bigger a bigger national interest that we are looking at in terms of how does it make Nairobi um, you know a global or regional hub? What else does it do to our tourism and hospitality industry? So there's all Sorry, that. I know, uh, I know we're winding up, has, but, you, but I know we're winding we, up, John. Uh, Paul, to, I know. Uh, Sorry, yeah. Sorry, I know we're winding up, Paul, but you raise an interesting point. Yes, that it is beyond just a business. It is a national asset, and therefore the logic behind some of this nationalization talk is that let us retain it as a strategic asset and prop it up. Um, as you conclude those comments. Sorry, I missed, I missed all that, Alan. Sorry. Sorry. One, once more, I um, uh, apologize for the quality of the signal. I hope you can hear me now. You can just nod yes. if you can. Um, well, while you were talking, you mentioned that Kenya Airways is more than just an airline, right? It's, it's a national asset, and therefore, some of the thinking behind nationalization is that it is a strategic asset and should be propped up as such so that it can compete with the likes of Ethiopian Airways with, without some of the encumbrances that Ethiopian Airways has done without for so many years. So as you're winding up your, your, your comments, maybe you can rebut um, those comments that have been made by people in, in management at Kenya Airways. I think uh, people at Ethiopia Air are dying to be Kenya Airways today. Uh, it's just to be given the flexibility to make decisions uh, as swiftly as Kenya Airways can be able to do. While we are looking at just one side of Ethiopia Air uh, in terms of the advantages it gets from being a national carrier, um, I mean a um, uh, nationalized carrier, so to speak, there are so many other advantages that we have uh, uh, that actually far outweigh uh, just being a national carrier. So it can still bring on board all those strategic interests for the country without necessarily being um, uh, uh, nationalized. And, and, and for me, that is really what I'm thinking. But if you really need to put KQ out there, you government the biggest shareholder, put money in, into it and, and look, uh, you can tell me that they have opened up their spaces and Emirates and everybody is coming to eat their lunch. That could be one argument. But competition is not necessarily a bad thing. We've looked at what happened even in the telco. Uh, we found, um, we found uh, global companies that have come here and they have struggled to, 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 to beat the local market. So opening up a market does not necessarily uh, translate into um, uh, killing your own asset. It gives you some level of thinking in terms of what other people are doing and challenges you to do better. So I think KQ can do better, uh, uh, but we wish them well. All right. Um, George Bodo, investment analyst, and uh, Paul Wafula, uh, investigative journalist for the, the Daily Nation. Thank you very much for joining um, this, uh, this interview, this webinar, and uh, this preamble to uh, the, 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 the documentary that we're launching, Fall of the Pride. Um, I just want to make a quick plug here to those of us, those of you who've joined us, please continue to share and continue to follow our work here at Africa Uncensored and comment on the documentary. These are important issues that will become part of the national discourse at some point in time. So please follow um, and share our work. Uh, many thanks to the producer of this documentary, Modri Sonyango, as well as uh, video editor John Gathuna, cameraman um, uh, uh, Elijah Kanye and Samuel Munia, as well as the people who did quite a bit of the legwork in terms of the research. We got a lot of help from our friends at Finance Uncovered as well as uh, locally, Purity Mokami, our data uh, analyst, and Morphin Joroge, our data reporter, and a number of other people who were helped that I can't name in this space and time, but nonetheless, thank you very much. Uh, George, once again, Paul, thank you very much for joining us, and we'll be seeing you within the documentary, although that there, there I can't ask you questions. You've already made your comments. Asante, thank you very much, and please do enjoy the fall of the pride, share it, and let's talk about this um, as we move towards nationalization. Asante. Continue.